Oh my, okay, so we actually have more brushes. I forgot to mention these um, in the prior segment, so I wanted to catch up on that. So we've seen the algorithmic anti-aliased pen. Um, we can access that from the brush settings right here. There's probably a shortcut to it, by the way. You should probably familiarize yourself with the uh, keyboard shortcuts here somewhere. There you go. Uh, a lot of features can be very uh, useful when you use them quickly again and again with a keyboard shortcut. Uh, not the least of which is the most recent uh, recent addition, spacebar. Press spacebar to get a quick color picker. Right. Um, so we have the anti-aliased algorithmic pen. That's this one here. Then we have some internal brushes, and we have shapes for them. Many different shapes uh, of internal brushes. Then we have custom brushes, right? And um, the custom brushes and some of the many of the internal brushes are also accessible here. You can right-click on this brush tool, and many of these here are internal brushes, and a bunch of them also are custom brushes. Then we also have shortcuts to another type of uh, another category. Uh, actually, before I mention those, uh, custom animator brushes is sort of a special case of a custom brush in which there are more than one images. There could be two images, three, four, or a whole frame sequence from an AVI file, for instance. All right, and there's many tools that allow you to work with those. Now, there's also a whole category of particle-based brushes, and we call them particles, particle brushes right here. First uh, panel right there. And then there's also a new subcategory, um, that's the orbitals. Before that, we also had introduced another type called bristles. So these are all kind of in the category of particle brushes, and we see them in the optical uh, octopus. Uh, that's the octopus panel right there. All right, so Many of these brushes, especially here internal and custom brushes, can not only be used to draw into your color channels, but also into the alpha channel. And in fact, you have uh, an option right there, paint on alpha, which is kind of a shortcut to just go directly do that. Right. So when you when you go and say hard 50, it's a custom brush that's 50 by 50 in, in dimensions. Uh, you can probably store it right there to see it. Uh, but most importantly, when you paint with it, the moment you let go of the mouse, it's transferring this into the alpha channel. And you actually painted a selection. Okay? You can paint with the left button, and you can also paint with the right button. My right button color is white right now, so if I'm choosing red, I'm going to see it as red. But the moment I let go, it's basically putting that into the alpha channel as a removal of the alpha. Left button is drawing or adding to the alpha right button is removing. So you can create very sophisticated selections with that. Right? You can go and, for instance, let's go and clear alpha, that's on the selection menu right there, clear alpha. You can do a selection like this and then another one on the inside and then you can draw a cut here and you draw a cut here and maybe one that's going to the outside and all sorts of really sophisticated shapes you can create with that. That now you can pick up as a custom brush. Right? So you can go and say, user selected as a custom brush, or as a brush. I mean, for us, that means custom brush. Right? It will look at the selection here, and you can first preview it if you want to be sure that's what you want. So you can look at the store alpha option, and you see what the selection is here in white. And if that's good, what you do is you say, user selected as brush. So you now pick that up as a brush, and you can go and store it. It's a custom brush where the selected part got the color, which is white. And the unselected part, the non-selected part, remains transparent. So we don't really care what the color is and we don't see it here. You can now go and paint with that. Right? Now I'm still painting in alpha, so <laughs> we want to make sure we don't do that. We use this uh, escape key to undo that. And you're now painting uh, with this custom brush in the, with the left button or the right button. And of course you have all sorts of other ways to use it now. All right, so... Um, that's the uh, using it in the alpha channel. You can you can you can paint directly on alpha. Uh, some of these shortcuts are really useful, uh, but you can also go to the selection tool and say paint on alpha. So pretty much regardless of what it is that you have currently as a brush, the regular brush or the the custom brush, the internal brush, and so on. These brushes you can use them to paint on alpha. Essentially, that goes actually over to this category of features. Uh, where is it there? The settings. Um, when you look at the settings, there is a post effects option here. And that's a post tool, or a post effect, meaning that it's doing after you let go of the mouse button. You paint something, and then when it's done, when you're done, it decides to actually put that somewhere else to work. Like it may add a shadow to it, or it might emboss it, 
or it might do a, a special trick to make it look like opaque watercolor or translucent watercolor. All right, so th those are post effects. And then it also has a modal option. And if you decide to, to make it go modal, you can tell it to go into the alpha channel. Or it could be an additive paint or a subtractive paint and so on. So there's a variety of choices for the brush to be processed directly here. Uh, the alpha is exactly what we use when we want to actually paint into the alpha channel. All right. All right, so in order for that to actually work, you need to enable this post effect mode. And now you have a selection that's painting into the alpha and you can easily create even more sophisticated shapes with that. So the selection mass can be horrendously com complex with that. It's all a matter of uh, choosing the right mode and to go with it and it's, the power is in the brush. Alright, so there is a couple of other brushes to be aware of or tools that contain their own brushes actually. So we have seen paint on alpha, now there is also penny paint. Now when you go to the window menu you'll see a penny paint option. What that is, is basically another paint program. It's a paint program within the paint program, right? You think you got one when you bought dog waffle, well, you actually got two. <laughs> you got penny paint with that. And what that does is it grabs a copy of the current image buffer that you had. That's this one down here, right? It grabs a copy of it and puts it into a separate floating window. And that's the pen penny window. And it brings its own set of tools. Now, here are four brushes in that tool. That's why I, I described this also in the brush overview, because there are really four more brushes. Um, and these are brushes for artists who like to do line art. So if, let's say, you have an an, you're an anime or a manga artist, and you like to do line art, you want to set the size, and then you want to use your tablet. By the way, I'm not on a tablet here, so this is not going to be the best possible. This is These are a pressure sensitive. These are anti-aliased. These are spline interpolated. So no matter how fast you draw, they will never show any jaggies. And you can go really, really fast. It's spline interpolated all the way. It's also anti-aliased. So you can see that when you zoom in, there's a nice anti-aliasing smoothing effect going on there. And it's just a perfect appearance for line art. Uh, but it's raster. Okay. Um, let's see what else we got here. We got 100%, we got uh, the pan around, so we got the four brushes. Uh, these are the four brushes here. I got uh, a color mode I can choose, I got a couple of different uh, options here. The size, pressure, um, and then opacity. So some of these options are going to be really good when you have uh, a tablet, when you use this with a tablet. This paper also, you can have a paper texture appear uh, as it's being applied into the brush here. All right, so so these are great tools for line artists. Um, you have tools here like painting tools. Let's do without the paper for a second. So you have sort of uh, look at that. This is pretty neat. Okay, paint, keep painting, and it just it looks like it's just adding to it, right? You can easily fill it. But then when you go with another brush stroke, it puts it on top of that, and it's so it's sort of an additive, cumulative effect. Right, like like translucent watercolor that you keep stacking up on top of each other again and again. Right. Uh, that's another one. Then this one here is perhaps the most uh, typical one, the inking option here. Uh, so with that you can go and ink it and make it more and more opaque until it's fully dark. Then there is also a really nice one here called the gel. Right, so uh, just as a recap, we have a pen, we have a water brush, we have the ink, and we have the gel brush. So the gel brush, uh, that one's actually pretty nice. Uh, it creates some nice, uh, almost like a toothpaste gel coming out of the toothpaste here. But you can also add brush, uh, you can also add the paper effect to that. And so, uh, you know, it, uh, no, no description of the many brushes in Dog Waffle would be complete unless we also include this. This is a separate program called Penny that's included and actually a, kind of a plug-in to Dog Waffle. It connects to Dog Waffle the moment you launch it. In fact, at any moment you can go here and say send something back to Dog Waffle or get the image from Dog Waffle. Right, so what you can, for instance, right now this image here I have in the Penny buffer and I have this image still in Dog Waffle. Well, what, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to store the image that I have in Dog Waffle. Store this image. So I have a little snapshot here, right? And then I'm going to go here and say, send this image that I have in, Dog, uh, in, in Penny, send it to Dog Waffle. So now I have that sent into the Dog Waffle buffer. And if I don't like it, 
I can get rid of it, or I can paint over it, or I can click here, the stored image, to re recoup that. But I still have the one in Penny. All right? So these two programs have their own image paint buffers, their own tool sets, also this one here, and Dog Waffle has its own tool palette right there. All right? So just, before, just because you see them both at the same time doesn't mean necessarily you're going to use them together. Uh, you can use this one here to paint in the main buffer, and you can use this tool the tool palette from Penny to paint in the Penny buffer. Now, one more thing to remember is that um, the way to use Penny really is to quickly use these images, uh, these brushes to create your line art and then send it in to Dog Waffle. Now, if you were to forget, don't worry, because when you click, when you close this image, it automatically sends it. Here, we'll see that right there. I'm going to close this image and it's going to automatically send the image right back in there. Right. Okay, so nothing is lost. You still have that and you can go and store this and work on with it. So the idea with Penny is that you have just another collection of uh, brushes that are in its own spline interpolated, anti-aliased and pressure sensitive brushes. And uh, I think it's also a 32-bit uh, resolution. So it's, it's a little bit higher definition on the, the precision for the positioning of the, the brushes. Anyway, so something to explore. And I had one more. Let's see what else. Um, Penny Paint. Oh yeah, the Curve Tool. Now, why mention the Curve Tool? Uh, the Curve Tool has evolved a lot. Version 7.1 uh, actually already version 5 and then 6 even more but 7.1 has a tremendous amount of new features but one thing you've seen already before is um, let me go and erase this here actually let's erase it to to white um, let's see let's go here and erase to white there so when I draw a curve uh, normally you click a point, you click another, and once you have four or more points you see it as an interpolated curve, although you can force it to a line going through. Now remember the brush we had before, maybe it was uh, this one here, right? Well, if we have the line art, the curve tool I mean, right there, we can actually have that curve, we can have that brush go along this path. We simply click right there. All right, so it, it goes along that path. Let's make it a little bit smaller just to see this better. So I'm going to go like so and perhaps also give it a little bit of a tint, change the hue a little bit. There you go. Something like this. So this is now, I'm still in the curve tool. I'm going to start a new curve, erase there. Okay, I want now that brush to go along this path. So I'm going to simply click here and it's going along that path. Now. What if I didn't want to have to do this in too many steps? What if I want to actually just draw a, a brush stroke, like this one here, the freehand draw mode, right? And I want to immediately have it render my brush along that path. That's the auto mode right there, right? So if I draw a brush stroke like this, it immediately, the moment I let go, it renders this brush along it. Now that can actually create another set of really complex shapes. And uh, so that's almost like its own category there of brushes. In fact, it can even simulate pressure. Uh, I'm using a mouse here, I'm not using a tablet, but if I'm using this mode, look what's gonna happen. Let's go and erase and draw a brush stroke. Ah, nothing's happening because my custom brush that I'm using here is not allowed to transform unless I go to my custom brush uh, feature or option in the brush settings and tell it to allow custom brush transforms. Alright, let's see if that's better. So I'm gonna go here. No, still doesn't do it. Maybe I need to tell it that I want to simulate brush pressure. There you go. Size, tablet on the brush and now we have it behave like a tablet and we have a brush stroke with changing size along the path. So that's also a kind of a, a brush in its, of itself. But it, it really shows that, you know, in, in Dog Waffle, more and more as you use these brushes and combine with other things too, uh, you'll see, for instance, if you enable, I don't know if this does anything, let's do the horizontal mirror. Yeah, sure enough, the moment you draw one, it's drawing the other one in a mirror mode too. Right. So that's that's one thing about dog waffle is that many times you use a brush or you use a particular feature but then what's coming out of it <laughs> can be even more sophisticated than you thought because there's just a lot of detail that uh, gets processed with it in addition to just the brush tool itself. Uh, you have, for instance here, uh, if you use the 
um, the step distance if you increase that step distance um, you'll see that the dots are a little bit more separated right a little bit more distant and so there's there's a lot of stuff going in here <clears throat> and there you go so that's uh, that was the quick addendum to uh, even more brushes and perhaps we have just here a little quick uh, recap let's get rid of the mirror and there you go so let's go to our regular image there you go so we got algorithmic anti-alias pen we got internal small image brushes um, with these shapes and there's many to choose from here um, and then we also have custom or large image brushes and including those that contain more than one a whole image sequence so a custom animator brushes uh, then you have particle brushes, bristle brushes, and orbicles, a very special type of 3D particle brushes. And then you also have paint on alpha and paint, uh, penny paint and the curve tool. One more thing perhaps on the particle brushes I should also mention is that uh, whatever you have here can act as a force field. Right? And the force field will deflect the particles. Let me show you an example. I, I use this image now and I'm going into the particle brushes and I enable the particle brushes to go with uh, a fairly large velocity let's give it uh, 9 initial velocity so it shoots out pretty far, pretty strong and I give it a long lifespan I'm gonna give it uh, first of all I'm gonna give it more splits and I'm gonna give it a long lifespan where's the lifespan there? 33 so it actually it gives me very long tufts of grass now I'm going to undo this and I'm going to tell so the system to use this current image I have as a force field so that the particles are not free to go wherever they want. They're going to be affected by the force field and contained or guided and trapped by them. All right, so here's what we do. Um, let's look at the particle brushes and right there there is a FF, right? The particle panel right there, FF as in force field. When you do that, it looks at the image and says, oh, we got this image, all right? So let's look at the grayscale value as a gradient and, and interpret that as basically a force field. So now you can say, well, let's give it a lot of power. And as you're drawing now, you see these particles becoming very kind of erratic or, or like they're being trapped by these, these blobs, right? And it doesn't matter if these blobs are actually there or not. But I mean, right now you can see where they are going and trapped. But what if we erase this? It's still there. The force field was captured and it's using it. So you can create some, some other really interesting shapes and, and appearances simply by using one original image as a force field. Let's take another example. Let's actually use a, a filter uh, to render, I don't know, a cellular pattern or maybe a grid. There you go. Let's go with a grid pattern. And, um, oh, actually, I need that grid to be really visible. So let's go with uh, a blank image initially and go and render the grid. And uh, let's make it to a dark color so we can see it. A little bit bigger. There you go. So that's our grid, right? And I'm going to use that as my force field. There you go. The old one is gone. Here's the new force field. And I'm going to give it a lot of power and force drag there you go now look at what's happening it's again containing it or affecting where my particles are being brushed to if i reduce the force drag it's a little bit more free to go but it still shows that general structure right and then if i reduce the power it's just going wherever it wants but i can use the force drag all the same and have it basically trapped by those lines on the grid look at that Alright, so that's another really, really interesting feature with the particle brushes, they say, where you use the particle brushes as um, as a force field, and I mean, with a force field, where you use an, another image, uh, a prior image, as a force field, and, and then you can have it uh, affect where your particles actually go. Now, uh, if you if you make this, uh, let's say, where's the particle brush here, if you make these fairly uh, fat lines, so let's say shrinking lines, fairly wide ones, and perhaps you give it a sort of a reddish let's go uh, with the pink uh, with the colors here on, on red lots of red all over uh, a little bit of blue but not too much there you go so so we have we have particles that are now going much fatter much different color and again 
<laughs> very sophisticated appearances that you can create. All of that by combining just a couple of different parameters. Let's look at the mirror once more time here. I'm gonna go with the horizontal mirror. So what I'm doing on the right side is also appearing on the left side. Okay, so we got particle brushes that are trapped by a force field that are shrinking and changing color against the gradient and that are being mirrored all in real time. And that is done with PD Pro 7.1 in this case.